Hello and welcome to this third episode of Wise Women Contemplate Turbulent Times. The intention with these calls is very much to give inspiration, guidance, hope, clarity, and hopefully some resources in these really challenging and chaotic times, which are causing huge problems for so many people. And I'm co-hosting this call once again with Juliet Yelverton, who is a trauma healing expert who created the Healing Waters Sanctuary in Glastonbury. And our two wise women guests this week are Davina McHale, who is a Hay House author, a shamanic seer, and co-founder of the Sipapu Center in Peru. And Davina's beaming to us from the Amazon jungle. We also have Marion Bevington, who is a public speaking coach and co-creator of Find Your Why. And just to give some context for this week's call, here in the UK, we've just had um, Wales go into a, a firebreaker lockdown, which has caused massive outrage because of all of the things that you're not allowed to buy in shops, which are considered non-essential, things like baby clothes, greetings cards, newspapers, magazines, books. So there's been a lot of outrage which has broken over the weekend, causing the, we think, the the Welsh uh, First Minister to back down. The interesting thing to me, which unfolded in the context of our wise women call, is last week, a woman, Maureen from Barnsley, who's 83, became a social media star for speaking out against the government. And people were saying, Maureen for Prime Minister. And she was interviewed on Good Morning Britain, and it was the most patronising interview I think I've ever seen. And it drove it home to me just how little we honour respect and value old people in this country. It really felt from that interview on Good Morning Britain, if you look at it on YouTube, that we don't give wise women like Maureen of Barnsley the credit for being wise at all. She was treated like a sort of doddering old crone, really, to be honest, by the presenters. I really felt for her, and her husband really stood up for her. So this is the kind of context that we are stepping forward as wise women. And um, I'd just like to just come over to you, Juliet, to add some context and um, how you're feeling about everything that's unfolding at the current time. Thank you, Rachel. And thank you very much for introducing and Davina and Marion for being with us on this call today. My intention on being part of this movement of wise women, supporting wise women in turbulent times, is that I'm really committed to bringing the truth around what's going on at this moment in time, as far as I know it. And also, more than anything else, supporting each person that listens to this video to uh, be more empowered, to be more resourced, to be less afraid and to be able to do something in their own life to actually transform because not only are we in uh, very fearful times, we're in very transformative times. Let's come to you first, Davina, just to check in with what's life like in Peru at the moment because I I know that things were much harsher there than they, they were even here in the UK. It's an interesting scenario. This, there, there is this global wave occurring. So at the beginning, um, I've been here since February this year. Uh, it was like I sort of left the UK and the door closed behind me <laughs> with no chance of return. Um, and it was draconian, with the original lockdown here. Um, military police with gun butts keeping people two metres apart on the streets. Really very difficult. But now, suddenly everything's open. And it's a really bizarre scenario. So we have a situation where masks are compulsory here. There's no option to be exempt. So I do wear a mask because, you know, I have military police on the street with guns. (laughs) So I'm a little, and I'm a foreigner, and so I'm I'm a slightly more compliant, even though I don't particularly wish to be on that level. Every single shop, in order to enter it, you have to, you, you get your temperature tested. Every single shop. Um, whether you're buying a pair of shoes or anything, like 
markets to begin with full disinfectant um, tunnels to walk through. So you get your temperature tested, you have to use hand sanitizer, alcohol, so the poison going in by your skin in terrific. But they all have security guards, they all have heavy duty armed police on all of these shop doors and things of that nature. So there's not really many options for standing up in that process. But then I was coming back from um, along the Amazon, you know, the river, back from our place actually in the jungle the other day, and there were hundreds and hundreds of people because the river's very low at the moment, so it creates these fires, like these beaches, natural river beaches. And everyone was out, hundreds and hundreds of people, no social distancing, no masks, everyone just barbecuing and being like normal people and playing games. It was lovely to see. It was, it was, like, it was like, wow, because I've never seen it um, in that reality all coming back on crazy overcrowded boats, et cetera, et cetera. So, and then as soon as they're in town, they just put the mask on and comply. So that, so if this COVID thing, whatever this thing is, was highly infectious as it is meant to be, by now there should be people dropping dead on the streets, I would have imagined here, and nobody's even mentioning it. There doesn't appear to be any cases. There doesn't appear to be any increase. So I'm not really sure what the South American narrative is on that, but we're in this very open phase now, having been in the very strict lockdown. Wow. Okay, Davina, thanks for letting us know what's happening there in Peru. Uh, Marion, what is your take on things that are unfolding right now? So the way that it's unfolding is I'm not taking in much news and I've been quite busy this week. So you were just my news reporter in the introduction, actually, Rachel. So thank you for that, because I had no idea. I'd seen a few furious postings about Wales. But for me, it's like on three levels. So there's my inner relationship and how I'm coping. And I'm at the moment in a beautiful apartment. I'm staying with my brother in my brother's flat looking after his cats. I've got a garden and it's just a really like palatial little place for me to exist during this process. So personally, I'm having a great experience and the cats are healing really nicely while I'm here. And then the next layer are the people who I know and I interact with who generally have similar opinions and behaviours to me. So we don't wear masks and we talk about it. We're in the non-mask tribe, if you like. And then there's the community, there's the field of everybody, which is obviously much more impacted by the having to, the shoulds, you know, the authoritarian dictates, if you like. And so in that outer field, I'm really aware of how I am in that process. And when I get dragged into the story and the fear in that outer circle, I feel really angry. I don't know if fear is coming up so much at the moment, but there's definitely an anger of how very dare they impose such draconian statutes on us when there's so much evidence in so many possible directions to draw the conclusions that have been drawn make no no sense at all. My background as well, I'm, um, I used to be in IT. I was a really quite uh, technical geek for many years. So I talk about my work now as I used to program computers and now I deprogram people. So I see <laughs> how the programming in this wider field, how powerful it is. But I know in my little field how powerful it is because I can program the computer to do exactly what I want. So I've got this really weird in between. And then luckily I've got this wonderful cushion of my social circle and my colleagues and my friends and my clients that are, even if they're not in a similar opinion or point of view, they accept me because I they, they just say, well, I just say I live on planet Marion. It's a weird and wonderful place. So it's it's like they exit, they accept that I exist in this weird space of, self-contained, fabulous, okay, everything's okay here. And I externally, oh my God, I don't know what to do out here. And they're happy for me to play either role. So I've got this really liberated, really, I'm really honoured to be in a really liberated space that I can still continue to be myself. And I don't live in a place where there are military police. So I'm prepared to stand in front of a policeman and say no. But I wouldn't do that if I'd been brought up in a country where they had guns. I've lived in South American countries. I certainly wouldn't be doing that in Brazil, where I used to live. But in England, I will. So again, I've, and I'm in England at the moment. I'm living here. 
So it's just, it's almost like it's affording me the opportunity to really see the contrast that's in my own experience and my own existence. And I know that that actually helps me to be that, you know, that pebble, and it's all very metaphorical and a bit cliched, but the pebble that I am in this ripple of oceans is, um, yeah, it's ju it just feels really, it's magnificent, actually. And at the same time, the depth of the programme and the depth of the fear in the general community outside of me has gone way beyond anything I ever knew could exist at that level of it of power that it has over people. Um, so the, the awakening to me, is, if you like, has been how, how easily programmed we are, mm. how good and powerful those programs are, how all pervading they can be. Um, and so now understanding from my healing journey how to help others, because when you're in the program, you're in the program and you don't know what you don't know. And I have to open my heart to that because if I want to tell anybody what to do, I just have to remember, I ain't taking that off anybody. Nobody's going to try and change me, not, not with my will. So how dare I go out there and try and change anybody else? This is the interesting thing, isn't it, about how far out do we go? It's like some of the people in Wales were saying, it's none of your business. You don't even live in Wales. Leave us alone. Mm -hmm. You don't have any right to comment. Mm -hmm. So this thing about how far out do we go? Mm -hmm. Do we just look after our own affairs and just keep up into our own little bubble? Or do we do we speak out and try to shift things that are going on? I mean, speak, speak to us a bit about that, Juliet. Well, first of all, we are all interconnected. I mean, this is a fundamental principle in Buddhism and, and it's also an environmental principle, isn't it? That everything that I do affects somebody else. And this is also um, the very powerful aspects of trauma healing is that our nervous system is programmed through the nervous system of the person that we're in close relationship with. So we are interconnected and this whole issue is a global issue. Mm. We've been listening about the global elite, which many people call conspiracy theory but that is falling by the wayside now because Robert F. Kennedy for instance only a few days ago for those that don't not know him he's a lawyer he's the the son of Robert Kennedy who was the brother of John Kennedy and Robert F. Kennedy has been campaigning about um, vaccine safety for a very long time and awareness and taking the vaccine companies to court and so on so he's now stepped forward and really named what's happening as definitely the work of a global elite. And he's named Bill Gates, he's named Fauci, he's named many, many people in this and has taken legal action against all the tech giants, all the social media platforms, all the fact checkers, and really calling it out so that there is quite definitely a global plan to take away the freedom of humanity so i don't think any of us can say oh this is just my problem it's not somebody else's problem you know it, it is everybody's problem in so many ways and um, how we address this is, is really the key issue because as marion said nobody when you i engage my will nobody's going to change the programming that i have nobody's going to change the way i view the world and we've had this slow shift happening now from those that have complete disbelief that there's any alternative motives and that it's really a covid pandemic move into actually seeing that there is something very very sinister happening it does seem to be going more mainstream because um, this was the interesting thing about Maureen from Barnsley and one of the things I was inspired to look into which was triggered by one of the doctors speaking out who mentioned the Ofcom regulations and he was saying that that is the reason why he is not allowed to go on mainstream media and he said you know look them up so I did and it's quite alarming the Ofcom regulations prevent any licensed broadcaster from broadcasting anything that questions the government narrative this is here in the UK or would lead viewers to have their belief in the government narrative undermined and that is why when Maureen from Barnsley was interviewed, they put on a scientist who completely tried to diss everything that she said. And it was quite shocking. But I don't think most people realize that Ofcom has completely prevented freedom of speech 
in the UK media. So it's, it's a very interesting situation. Well, this is what Robert Kennedy has just addressed. He's been censored on all the social media platforms and he has said quite clearly that everybody is stitched up in one way or another. When we censor public information, when we censor people's freedom of speak, then this is really the first step in a very severe problem, a very uh, dangerous situation whether you call it communism, fascism or whatever, but this is quite definitely what's happened worldwide. And this is why so many people can't speak out or when as soon as they do speak out, then they're censored like the frontline doctors that had 17 million viewers in six hours were completely obliterated from all social media platforms. We have to find ways to talk to each other which aren't through those platforms. We have to communicate, and this is why each individual, it's important that we do talk to other people and express how we feel. But then we come into other issues, and this is how it's interrelated with trauma, that it's, it's so risky to our personal relationships if we get rejected by our loved ones when we speak out. Davina, let's just come across to you and just look at this from a shamanic perspective about overwhelming power. You could say it's evil power and how to diffuse that, transmute it, alchemize it, heal it. I I tend to veer away from that word evil. I would think of it simply as heavy energy, very dense, heavy energy. It's future and it's only humans that create that through our sort of unenlightened aspects of self, you go with mind, that personality that is where all the programs are held. So one way we can actually release it into the earth, but, you know, there's always irony. Nothing ever goes one way. So we have to, it, it's a process because you need to be in love. It's like it's offered, it's not your dumping on the earth because then the earth might dump back, <laughs> so to speak. So it's being allowed to like open your channels and just release into the earth with love because there is a um, frequency hierarchy if you like there are lighter heavier lighter energies the earth itself is material physical matter it has a dense form and the higher solar energies are lighter so we are kind of the humans are the conduit between heaven and earth if you want to see it in those terms and so we are the mulchers of these two dualistic energies and so with our love letter to the earth of actually releasing through the soles of the feet, through the perineum, to really just open those channels and let it flow through. We understand this. If you've ever taken your shoes and socks off and go for a walk on the beach, I know we're prevented from such things now, but we can stand in our gardens, just being barefoot on the earth and just but opening the soles of the feet, opening the perineum, and just let, just offering and saying, thank you. Thank you, Bachi Mama. Thank you, Mother Earth. Just thank you for this is my offering to you of what I hold in this moment, but it is given with love. It's really important that there is this giving of love and this offering rather than a dumping. That's one way of just keeping our field clear and moving because it's very easy. I mean, you can see the the global narrative is all fear, divide and conquer. I know these have been spoken about on this program. It's very clear when you're outside it. And I've been very privileged in some ways to be in the Amazon. Because during the most intense months of this, I was literally in the jungle without connection to any Wi-Fi. was no marks, no nothing. I had no idea what was happening in the world or on the planet. Thank you. Thank you, universe, for sticking me there. That was a great gift. So I was there just communing with the trees, with nature. I mean, it's, a, it's an extreme environment. And the, the nature is kind of not, not uh, pretty in that sense. Um, But I could see it in the nature. And what the biggest teaching of really pain, of understanding what love is, in that force of love is just the energy of creation. And for us, from a shamanic perspective, to, because shamanism is not a dogma or belief. It is a, it's a way of being in relationship to life. And to really understand that the love is what we're creating. So the spider or the ant or the mosquito, is no, it, there's no separation between me and those things. and that, Because that is just the creative force of love produced that. In the same way it produced me, you, and every single other thing. And it's understanding that you have this enormous power inside, which is our imagination, our I, my guy nation, our magic nation. And to really understand that we can choose to be in a different timeline. I can feel, when I tune into the UK, I can feel the darkness. I can feel this hoochah, this really dense, heavy energy that's almost encapsulated it. 
And thank goodness for you, ladies. Thank goodness for you and others like you that are holding that position of light. I see it from every time I put my head above the parapet and post something that's sort of slam dunk response you get. It's like, wow, these are my friends. What happened while I was gone? <laughs> you know, because of the fear, because of this amazing divide. You know, the, the engine, the global engine has an extraordinarily organized script. And it's very, very well practiced in how to do the divide and conquer, how to program the fear response. And it's working extremely well. So we have to, as you've said, Rachel, many times, that pattern interrupt, but also to use, not just pattern interrupt, but to use our power to imagine a new world, to imagine what we would love to create with the love inside us, with this ever, never-ending force of creation. And to really start to put our attention and our energy on that. And on a very practical level, I would love to see, there are all these amazing people, all having, like, coming, you know, out of the woodwork, being brave enough to speak up, getting censored everywhere, to actually kind of almost create a doctrine of questions. Because there are many unanswered questions that are being censored. Just not, you know, let's get out of the... Because, of course, anybody that questions the, the you know, mainstream narrative of us, we're all, you know, labelled bonkers or conspiracy theorists. That's their trick. You know, that's the way they undermine it. But to actually have a kind of a consensus list of questions. All we're asking is for these questions to be addressed. Where did this come from? What is this about? You know, why are you doing this? You know, where is your evidence? Where is your science? Very clear, straightforward, coherent that actually came from all, that all of us could sign up, even though we, because some of us are more extreme than others. Some of us are more into the extreme, you know, yes, it's all run by a Satanist cabal or whatever. You know, there are many evidence on different levels and but I think some kind of almost questioning manifesto that could gather momentum that is just like playing the old record over and over again. No, we want these questions answered, but you're not answering the questions, but you're not answering the questions, but you're not yeah. answering the questions. That, that's precisely what, what Robert Kennedy in his um, broadcast said. He read out a list of questions. Right. Interesting. Yeah. Yes, very interesting. So I think you've really nailed it there uh, with what you've just said. Yeah. Yeah. Marion, as a public speaking coach, one of the things that people have said to me is, thank you so much for speaking out because I don't feel I can, I don't feel I have the voice, I don't feel I have the power, I'm too frightened. So what would your advice be on how to, to make that leap to open, to express anger, fear, questions, whatever people are feeling right now that they're too frightened to maybe to say anything about? The fear of speaking out can often be because we don't know the language needed to express what we're feeling. And the reason that we don't know the language to express what we're feeling is the work that with Juliet that I, I understand much more beautifully now about trauma, especially young trauma and pre-birth trauma. Trauma isn't just a one-off PTSD event. It's a situation or situations that I keep going into that make me feel a certain way, usually feeling out of control or a survival risk, I suppose is one way of naming it. So when I'm pushed into a place where there's a survival risk, if that happens to me before I can even speak, then I know the feeling of that, but I've got no understanding of how that would express itself in language because that feeling doesn't come with its language. To be able to do public speaking, if I want to reach that depth of experience and speak from there, I actually have to learn how to speak from there. So I have to practice from that feeling place. What is it that I'm feeling? And what, can I, what words can I find in me or around me to bring this out? And then when I hear it, I'll go, that's the right word. Or no, no, that's not the right word. And I, I had um, a session with one of my teachers a few weeks ago, and I, she said to, to speak to a part that needs to be heard. But again, I feel this was a, a pre-verbal part, if you like. And so she said, well, where would she like to be? And there was like a, a hammocky chair thing in the corner. And I said, so I got in the chair and I actually turned over and faced the wall. And it was in that position that I felt safe enough to explore what the feeling was and ignore the other thoughts in my head and the voices in my head. And then actually allow myself to find the words that made this part go, yeah, that's me. Yeah, that's me. Yeah, that's what I want. Yeah, that's it. And get lots of 
connection, reconnection back to that wounded feeling. And then it helped me to, to put words into the mouth of that wounded feeling. And it, first of all, it didn't make sense. Uh, she swears a lot and she likes swearing, that little one in me, that inner child part of me. Um, and she just, she's just tired of being pushed around. That, that was the sense of it. I'm just tired of being pushed around. You can all leap off <laughs> because, because she'd been at such a young age suppressed. That language hadn't developed, and I know that that impacts my public speaking and definitely the clients that I've worked with. It, it, we have to come back to what's going on in the body because while we're doing public speaking, as soon as we trip into any space that feels there's a survival risk, and survival can be too much humiliation, too much fear of what people might say, getting it wrong, uh, the power over aspect can come in, anything that's going to create some kind of a disconnect is potentially going to put me in out of my center. And when I'm out of my center, I don't have access to the parts of me that really need to be spoken or really need to be expressed or really need to be heard. And if I can't stand on stage and allow those little pieces their freedom to express themselves because I'm in flow and they pop up all the time, I'm going to be speaking from a script in fear, I'm going to get it wrong, or that there's something, and so it's all too contained and too head-based and too script-based and shoulda, woulda, coulda-based. So there's no freedom in that. And in there's no freedom, there's no expression in that. So it's a big, deep question. Uh, hopefully that answered a little bit. <laughs> it's about practicing, practicing speaking from your feelings. Yeah, definitely. I was explaining this last week that in me finding my voice to speak out, which was only really in September, and I've done several videos since, I, it was actually a very a tremendously healing and cathartic experience to find that voice and to powerfully say no. Mm -hmm. And so many people um, really thanked me for expressing exactly what they were feeling. Yes. There's something deeply healing about finding that voice, finding that strong no. That lovely feeling when you know you're not alone. Yeah. Oh my God, it's not just me. That's such, I mean, how receptive the body becomes in that moment. We just like, you can really let go, can't you? And feel you're being held in a community of somebody else is having the same stuff. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Well, that's what I hope for people listening to this video that have come to us, that they can have that moment of, oh, my God, I'm not alone. Here are yeah. four wise women, four women who've considered things deeply that are having these feelings. And I think it's it's really useful for us um, to actually own, you know, as as wise women here, to own how we feel about this situation that's happening, not just to reiterate the theories and the facts and that. But, uh, I mean, for me, I, I find myself alternating between feeling very depressed, very flat, I can't motivate my life further, uh, to feeling really, really angry and outraged at what's happening, especially when I see elderly people walking along with masks and I see these dark, these dark eyes peering above the mask and they're absolutely fear, you know, they're in so much fear and I feel such a rage around that with what's happening with the children and so on and I feel such a rage that, uh, you know, people's lives worldwide have been injured in this way. And then on other days, I can find some buoyancy and motivation, and, and I spend a lot of time, many, many hours every day, uh, speaking out in one shape or form. And apart from that, actually doing what I can to support other people, to support mm. in some way for them to, to be able to manage their way, to navigate their way through these times. So keeping that human contact alive for everybody around us it is really important and really that balance that balance is yeah. so difficult isn't it because our activism to get humanity back into the kindness and love and respect it's so important and yet our activism will trigger those that are really stuck in the program so it's having the opposite effect and it's locking them in even tighter because our activism is so out there and so disruptive to them it's like that. So how can I, do I have to stop being an activist to love and support people? 
well, I can't do that. And, and so I do I have to give up loving and supporting people? And that to that to in and fro in is it's really it's exhausting. It's yeah. completely exhausting. So yeah. whoever's listening, however you're feeling, just know that that's you know that's normal for what's going on. We're we're being faced by tremendously challenging circumstances. However you interpret what's going on, it's still really really deeply challenging. To go back to that, actually, I'd just like to add another sort of layer into this because I was plunged this morning into even deeper fear of the future, actually. And I, I sent you the videos concerned, Juliet, because obviously I'm receiving all this stuff. Uh, they were videos from what's going on in Australia and what's happening in Canada. It would appear that from watching these, and you could just say they're conspiracy theories, but they really did stack together for me, is that there is a plan to introduce another virus to take things to a deeper level of fear called COVID-21, coming, which will come through in January. And just when we thought we'd got through this, there will be a third wave, an alleged third wave. This next level of fear is what's going to truly drive home the vaccinations. And then it was coupled with this concept, this proposal, allegedly from the Canadian government, that young people, to start with, young people would be offered in return for the eradication of all of their debt to take the, the vaccination and to be the first wave of the new citizens who renounce their entitlement to own anything. And they, they're the first wave who have the certificate of vaccination. It really just did plunge me into this level of despair that there is this global master plan and that they will kind of stop at nothing to drive home this, this vaccination program and to eventually create manageable transhumans. So I want to put a question to you here, Davina, about this, is that in the face of this sort of juggernaut of this, this master plan, which is very much in the matrix, if this truly is a global master plan to have a global reset, which all the countries have signed up to, which is what Klaus Schwab and the World Economic Forum have very plainly said, and even Boris Johnson has said it, this is the great reset, things are not, never going to go back to how they were. How do we, as a collective, how do we stop something like that from happening and from completing its mission, so to speak? Partly from what I said before, A, we have to own our own sovereign frequency. It has to start with us in, because I, I've been, in, I go down that rabbit hole sometimes and get those waves and I have to go, okay, stop. That's not healthy. If I allow myself uh, I'm not saying I'm denying the feeling because I will allow myself to feel it in that moment because it's important to be informed. Otherwise, um, we're ignorant and we're going to be enslaved without realizing it. But it's really important to go, okay. And I use the Katie Byron. Um, those four statements are actually very useful sometimes in that her process is, okay, is this always true? What am I feeling? You know, well, who would I be without this belief? What would happen if I didn't hold this belief? And so those, 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 again, questioning oneself, questioning one's own field, but really holding on to one's sovereign frequency, one's right to be. And that's a practice in itself. And one of my visualization practices that I'm really practicing on now, because when we are full, when we are truly full, that's what, that's what you know, we, we talk a lot about, all the spiritual teachings talk about gratitude. But I've been analysing, well, what is it about gratitude? What is it actually about thank you that, that works? And it's because it gives you a feeling of fullness. So it's like the ace of cups in the tarot, the holy grail, that, that toiled or fulling. When we are truly, when we practice gratitude, we become full. And then we can only but spill that out. And in the spilling out and the flow and the sort of expansion of our gratitude radiance, it starts to shift things, that, that pool starts to shift things into the earth, into the beings. I mean, it is about relationship with everything, but we need to maintain our sovereign capacity to feel full, but full of good, positive energy. And all of those, because then there's no space for that despair to come in. It's like, it reminds me of Harry Potter and the dement. what's happening now, it's like the dementors have taken over, isn't it? You know, the ones that suck all the joy out. If we, if we allow ourselves to go in there, you know, suddenly the joy. And we need to remember to love. 
to find, even in these dark times, to find humour. Um, I, I've really noticed that. That's been the thing I've noticed most. People don't laugh in the same way anymore. Mm. Because everything's, everything's, you know, and I understand, you know, people are losing their jobs, it, the pain bodies, you know, it's all, it's all horrible. And yet but we, our defense is laughter. Every, if you notice, every single thing that the mainstream narrative is doing robs us of our immunity. And good immunity is the one thing we need to fight whatever viruses are coming up. And we also have the ability, I believe, to utterly self-heal. So we can program our own system to not, you know, to be well, to be healthy, to constantly know you are a being of energy. A being of electrical impulses and light that is exactly the same. You have the power and the ability to have your own blueprint of health. And we need to be practicing this. Being in connection, because of course the, the things they do, denaturing us, making it impossible to go out into nature, to connecting to the, the natural world. All of the, you know, the big industries, the big tech, it's all inorganic. It's all robbing us of that connection to love. Because remember, nature is love. That's the creative principle. That's the creative force. Not having access to good food. More people, I believe, would have died of poverty here during the really lockdown pandemic than the COVID because they were blocking, blockading the roads to the villages and the towns. And so people couldn't get their food supply. I mean, literally, I, I know, you know, life stories of people that had lived on a, a, you know, a bag of rice for a few months because of, you know, they weren't ill. They didn't have COVID, but because of the lockdowns, they weren't able to access food. So this, all of this robs you of your immunity, not being able to have sunshine, having your mask on, being muzzled. All of these things rob you of your natural immunity that is what you need to feel good, well, and to be able to, you know, dispel the despair. Remembering, sorry, one thing I really, because this is the real thing with the masks, is we don't see each other smile. And the smile is the most powerful single symbol on this planet, to smile at someone, to give someone a smile. We've all had it when we've had a bad day. And that is the most insidious thing of this whole mask masquerade. Yeah. So take off your mask and smile. Yeah. Even if right. you just put it down and give someone a grin and put it back up, whatever you do. Yeah. But remember to smile at each other. Our greatest antidote is to be light, to raise the frequency, to feel Full, to find, put our attention on every tiny little thing we can be grateful for. To come into the small, to notice the flower, the blade of grass, the beautiful tree, to be in relationship. And also, those green beings, the trees, the plants, the flowers, are our allies. They are sentiment beings, and they will help us if we ask them, and we work in relationship with them. To be in relationship with the four elements that are freely given on this planet the solar, the earth, the water, the air, you know, our sovereign right to be in relationship with those because they are us. Well, yeah. you, Gina, wishing I was in the jungles of Peru. Actually, <laughs> <laughs> but you don't need to be in the jungles of Peru where, where, you, where you live, Rachel. You have beautiful surroundings and... Um, I think what you're saying, Davina, is so true. It's like we don't have to worry about what's coming. It's like what they're doing now is, is trying whoever they are. We keep yeah. saying they. But to rob us in that way, and, and to me it feels like that an attempt to rob us at a soul level, to rob mm -hmm. us of our humanity, and that we can reclaim our humanity moment by moment by all those very all those things that make us human, or like gratitude, like thanks, like um, being in nature, witnessing the beauty of the butterflies or the the trees or whatever, and the the world, you know, life, nature is incredible, and we are nature. Our bodies are nature. If we can really appreciate even that complexity of who we are and and the wonder of who we are, and alongside that to give thanks and, and to pray as well i i find myself praying more and more and that, uh, yes, you know, that <laughs> yeah that that spiritual practice whatever you know forever is listening here whatever your spiritual practice is in in whatever way and that there are many many ways to feel in connection with the divine 
it's like really engage in that, really honor yourself engaging in that and, and, you know, keep that alive for yourself, whether it's lighting a candle, burning some incense, singing, chanting, reading a sacred book, walking in nature, whatever your spiritual practice is. Maybe um, that's a nice thing to end on to, for each person to say what is their favorite spiritual practice to bring them back into that alignment with a higher power. Divina? So many. <laughs> <laughs> connecting to the apples for me, to connecting to the mountain spirits and just communing with, the, with my guides. My practice has been, it's interesting, as you were both saying, you're praying more. I thought, I don't really do praying. What have I been doing more of? Talking to the cats. Because <laughs> <laughs> they weren't well when I moved in. They were really both quite ill. And, and they've become like kittens again while I've been here. So they've been medicine to me. So they they smile at me with their playfulness and their level of energy that they have now. Wonderful. Get yourself a pet, everyone. I know, Rachel, you've really been uplifted by your pet. Yes, we have a little puppy, Kobe. And I have to say, you're absolutely right, Marin, because since that puppy arrived in this house, it's transformed the energy. And so yes. it's been so much time looking after him, stroking him taking for little walks to the river yeah. that it's healing me yeah. and it's looking after me. He's such a gift. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or, or help somebody if it's not a pet, just, just the act of doing kindness to another person, supporting them. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you all so much for joining. Juliet, do you want to just use the closing words? Yeah. It's just for everybody that's here today. Believe in yourself, no matter what's going on for yourself in this moment. Just believe in yourself and, and, and keep taking care of yourself in all the small ways that you can think of because you're really precious and that your life makes a big difference to everybody around you. I hope that in some small way our video has helped you today and we are all here. Gradually, as we do these videos, more and more wise women are going to be showing up. And I'm sure that all of us will help anybody that reaches out here. So if you want to contact any one of us here or on the past videos, or if not, then look for your nearest wise woman, because I'm sure there is one right next to you. Lots of love to you. Yeah, lots of love and big thanks. Thank you, Davina. Thank you, Marion. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thank you to thank everyone. You. Yeah, lots of lots of love and lots of love to you, Davina, all the way over in Peru. Okay, bye for now. Bye. So, Davina, I looked, your, your website is launching in August 2020. Apparently, yes. <laughs> <laughs> My excuses were still in very deep retrograde. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sure you've seen the, the ones we've done already. So this is the third. So we're still sort of experimenting with the format. Juliet and I are going to co-host it. So, Juliet, I'll, in, I'll do the introductions this week. Yeah, yeah just because my introductions, introductions are crap. <laughs> Pressure's off a little bit because you do do editing, don't you, Rachel? So it's yes. not like we're on live. Exactly. It's, so it's, I'll, yeah, less pressure. Like last time, I mean, if you notice, your your intro was really wonderful because I cut out all of the ums and the ers. To <laughs> <laughs> my intro. Oh, right. <laughs> Thank you. Like, Thank you. Yeah, because uh, there was. You notice there are no ums and ers in it. I didn't know I ever made any ums and ohs, so. <laughs> That's because you've only seen Rachel's edited version. <laughs>